So for years, there's been this little box that's been sitting on our coffee table in our living room. And inside this box is a bunch of questions. They're icebreaker questions like, if you could have dinner with one person in history, who would that be? Does somebody have one just, just, just right off the top of your head? Who would be your person? What's that? Mother Teresa? Gavin? Who? Albert Einstein. That's a good one. That's a good one. It might be another question like, if you had $10,000 but you had to spend it today, what would you do? I'm not going to get your answers to that. That that, that leads down a rabbit hole, but that's that's a really good conversation starter. And that's really what questions do, right? Questions are brimming with potential. Questions open up the opportunity for conversation and potentially for you to really get to know something important about the person that's sitting across from you. So let me offer a commonly debated question. Who do you think Jesus is? What would you say if someone asked you that question? What would be your response? Because I want to suggest that your response to that question colors everything. Well, this morning, uh, we conclude a teaching series uh, entitled The Great Questioner. Jesus was the great questioner. Jesus modeled for us this always curious engagement with people. He asked 314 questions in the gospel, in the gospels, and he only answered three. And so we, like good students, good disciples of Jesus, we've been practicing. We've been practicing our ability to be curious alongside Jesus, to ask really good questions. Because I believe that that really should be a characteristic, an attribute of Jesus' church. Because he did it first, right? So our kids give us a good example of that. So here's, here's a question from one of our kids. Um, I want to know how old is God? And what does heaven look like? Does it look like us? <laughs> So those are really good questions, especially from the mind of a kid. How old is God? What does heaven look like? There's a lot of mystery that's around that. So there's a really good conversation starter right there with the kid. So this morning we come to our last question. The last question that we'll look at um, offered by Jesus. And that is, who do you say that I am? So let's read the first part of our passage. Once when Jesus was praying in private with his disciples, and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But what about you, he said? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. So this passage starts in a way that I don't want us to miss. It talks about how Jesus was praying once when Jesus was praying in private with his disciples. Now, if you're a student of the Gospel of Luke, you will notice that throughout Luke, it's unavoidable that Jesus is just grounded in prayer. He is always finding reasons and opportunities to step away to go into the hills, to find a quiet space, to pause for a moment while he's going from this location to the next location. He is grounded in prayer. In fact, uh, prayer either precedes or it it actually, uh, many of the the main events, the the big happenings in the life of Jesus, they happen while he's praying or right after he steps away to pray. We think about these two passages Um, From Luke chapter 3, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven opened up and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, With uh, with you I am well pleased. 
It was while Jesus was praying after he was baptized that this amazing affirmation happens. I wonder if he would have missed it if he wasn't praying. I wonder if there's a connection point between his commitment to prayer and this amazing affirmation of God that says, you're my son, and I'm so pleased. How about in Luke chapter 6? One of, those, one of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. It was after an entire night of prayer that Jesus calls his disciples. He had spent time really trying to, to link himself, to, 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 to connect himself to the Spirit and to God's will, and who would be the right people? Who were the ones that would, that would follow him most faithfully? Who would have the skills? Who would be the ones that he could entrust the church to, his ministry to, after his death and his resurrection? So, I think that there's something that we can't miss about Jesus' commitment to prayer. And it was after he prayed, after he was praying with his disciples, that he comes, comes to these questions. The first question is, who do they say I am? Who do the crowds say that I am? Now, they had a, a lot of different opinions about Jesus. Most of them thought that he was a forerunner of the Messiah. They thought he was John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a miracle worker. He was a powerful teacher. He pointed to, this, is, this person's coming, the Messiah's coming. So a lot of them thought that he was kind of a reincarnation or, or John the Baptist. They also thought that maybe he was Elijah. Now, you might not know Elijah's story, but Elijah was believed to be the prophet that would come back and would actually announce this messianic age. He would come and they would know that it was about to happen because Elijah would show up and announce the Messiah's coming. There were others that thought that he was probably just a new prophet or maybe even an old prophet that, that was reborn. So the crowds, who, were, who was he talking about, about these crowds? The crowds that were following around were devoted Jews. They were devoted religious folk. And yet for some reason, they couldn't recognize him. They were devoted religious folk, and yet some, for some reason, they were walking around in the dark, looking for God, and God was standing right in front of them. Now, that might sound like a judgmental statement, but if, if we had to raise our hand as to how many times I was walking around as a religious person and had no clue where God was, hey, come on. I mean, we got to we got to just raise our hands. I mean, how many times have we just come to church and done our thing and just continued to show up and we do this and we do that and we talk to them and we say amen and then we go about our business and and really we walk around oblivious to where God is showing up and wanting to speak to us. I mean, we can't cast any judgment upon these crowds that too walked alongside Jesus, listened to his messages, saw these great works happening, and they couldn't recognize that the Messiah was standing right in front of them. Sometimes I look around at the church, and sometimes I've been this person, so there's no judgment here, but I look around at the church and I see where we're focusing our attention, where we feel like we're what God is calling us to do. And I go, really? Like, that's the priority? Like, there are a lot of churches that are really, really making it their thing to make sure everyone know who, knows who's, who's welcome here and who's not. I mean, do you think that's the ministry of Jesus? You think that Jesus would come and say, yes, that's exactly where I want you to devote your energy. Make sure the people that don't, aren't, aren't uh, invited, make sure they're not invited, right? We need to make sure. You can tell I get a little bit upset about that. I mean, don't you think that, that Jesus, as aligned as he was with the prophets, don't you think that he 
would be like, how about racism? How about poverty? How about injustice? Come on, church. I mean, there's plenty of different things that you know God has always been about. Many of us have walked around in the dark, so we don't judge. But we have to recommit ourselves to be the people that have their eyes open. And so how does that happen? How does that happen? So in verse, in verse 20, Jesus asks the question. I'll get to that in just a minute. Jesus asks the question, who do you say that I am? Who do you say? That I am, and 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 Peter, Peter's kind of like I kind of think that he was kind of like Ooh, me, 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 me. You know, kind of like the, the in the back of the classroom. I know, I know, you, you are the Christ. You are the Christ of God. Now, Peter had seen all the other things that the rest of the religious folk had seen, and for some reason, his his heart, his mind, his eyes were ready. His heart softened and he was able to recognize who Jesus was. And, and I want to point back, I think that at least a part of it that moves us from being religious people to Jesus followers, believers and followers, is exactly what we started the passage with. That when Jesus was praying, the disciples were praying too. That when Jesus modeled prayer and a life anchored to prayer that, that the disciples were praying to. And that prayer had opened their eyes. And that prayer of spending time with God had softened their hearts. And they were able to recognize God around them, recognize the Messiah around them. You know, prayer, like the simple Prayer is when God rubs off on us. That's the place. Most of the time, it's not when we're around people. I mean, we can do good things, and the church is bigger than just praying. But, but when, when God rubs off on us is in those quiet spaces where we step aside, where we regularly step, step aside into a quiet space where nobody knows, and we just be with God, and our heart is softened, our heart is reshaped, and we can see. I go to that Rob Bell. This is a really, really great reminder that uh, Rob Bell, Pastor Rob Bell, comes uh, to us with. He says, he says, walk, don't run. That's it. Walk, don't run. Slow down. Breathe deeply. And open your eyes because there's a whole world right here within this one. The bush doesn't suddenly catch fire. It's been burning the whole time. Moses is simply moving slowly enough to see it. And when he does, he takes off his sandals. Not because the ground has suddenly become holy, but because he's just now becoming aware that the ground has been holy the whole time. That is a life wide open. That is an eyes wide open life. And I feel like, friends, that one of the pieces, it might not be the only piece, but one of the pieces has to be a commitment to prayer, a commitment to quietly stepping away where God can open our eyes for us to receive and see the holy. So let's move on to the next part of our passage. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell anyone and he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed. And on the third day, he would be raised to life. Jesus starts off, maybe at this point he went, shh. Not everybody's ready for this message. There's some kind of mystery. There's a hiddenness about Jesus's messiahship, his call as, a, as the Messiah. So he said, shh, not everybody's ready to hear this yet. I am the Messiah, but I'm the Messiah that's going to suffer. I'm the Messiah that's going to be rejected at times. I'm the Messiah that's going to be killed. But I'm 
I'm also the Messiah that's going to be resurrected. Now, the Catholics call this the Pascal mystery. The Pascal mystery is, is very simply, it's basically the, the mystery of dying and rising. Death leading to new life. We see it on display as the seasons make their way through. We see the vibrance of summer give way to the leaves dying and falling to the ground, the dormancy of the winter time, and then yet what happens? The leaves become seeds and they burst forth and many times stronger than ever in the spring. That's this mystery of death and life. Death and life. We see it on display in the person of Jesus as well, leading us down a road that says you've got to let go of some things. You've got to die to some things if you really want to live. We talked about this in the, in the men's group on Wednesday night, this concept that in order to be the, the men that we want to be, the people, the humans that we want to be, that likely we're going to have to follow Jesus in this dying, in this letting go of something so that we can live. We looked at the verse that said, unless one seed falls to the ground and dies, then if it dies, it will be reborn basically in a hundred seeds. And so we too are called by this Messiah we're called to wonder, to consider, what do we need to give up? What does the Messiah ask of us? If we say, you're the Messiah, then what does the, what does the Messiah ask of us? The scriptures don't really tell us whether or not Jesus knew that this was the plan. That his, his calling would be the rejection and the suffering and the dying. We don't know, but I would expect that maybe it was a little bit at a time as Jesus prayerfully just offered himself again and again to God's will that ultimately he knew this was what was going to happen. Can you imagine that process of, of just Jesus realizing, okay, this is your way. And he submits himself to God's way. So this is how the passage ends. And then he said to them all, these are his disciples, those that have said, you're the Messiah. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Now, there's something that I want you to pay attention to, that, that when Jesus recognized his calling, he said, I must, because of what God is calling me to do, I must, I must be the Messiah that suffers and is rejected and dies. And so I want you to consider, as people who say that we are believers and followers in the Messiah, I want us to consider what we must do. What must we do in response to Christ's call on our life? What must we do? What are the things that, that God is calling us to let go of? What are the things that God is calling us to die to? So that we might come alongside and have eyes wide open and soft hearts and find God in all of those ways. All of the burning bushes that are around us, around every corner. For as a church, for us to lay ourselves out and to say, God, whatever it is that you want us to do, we're in. I'm, we're setting aside our own will and any agenda that we have. God, whatever is consistent with your heart, 
with what you want us to do, we're in. Even if it requires us to suffer. Even if it requires us to be rejected. Sometimes Jesus' message would lead us right down that same path that he walked. And so what I want you to consider this morning, and I know that we have a lot of people here that are first-time visitors or just visiting just a few times, and I'm, I'm primarily talking to the folks that are regular visitors, been here for a while with us, or our members. What I want you to consider is that I want you to consider a recommitment. What is, what must we do? What I, and I'm not going to say, I'm going to invite you to do this. You have to make the choice. What must we do? What do I invite you to do? I want, I want to invite you to recommit to our church. Today is a commitment Sunday. And so it's a time when we together say, I'm in. I'm in with where this church is headed. I'm in with what we feel called to do and say. And so I want to invite you to take, there's some cards in the middle of your table. And if you're a regular visitor or if you're a member of the church, I want to invite you to take that card and to consider how you might support and how you might serve. So we're talking about financial support because we're not funded by anyone else. It's just us. We're able to do what we're able to do as a, as a collective body financially. And we also want you not just to consider what you might give over the course of the year, estimate, estimate, but also how you might serve, how you might find your ministry, how you might find your calling within our larger ministry, all of those opportunities. And so I want you to, want you to think about that. I want you to consider that um, because I believe that God's calling is an extraordinary calling. It's a unique calling that's not for everybody. Uh, it is offered to everybody, but not everybody's ready to take it on. So consider that, pray about that, and now we're going to come to the communion table here in just a moment. So I could have my the elders in the band come up.